Good morning, everybody. Welcome to West Lafayette Christian Church. If you all want to stand as we uh, start worship this morning.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. storm surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every wave at your name Jesus Jesus darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus Pray. call these bones to live all these lungs to sing once again I will praise Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus, your name is light that the shadows can't deny, your name cannot be overcome, your name is life forever lifted high, your name Be seated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that we can be here uh, to worship together. We thank you for those uh, who are able to be with us here in person. We thank you for those who are able to be with us over uh, uh, the, uh, the technology that's available to us on Facebook. 
And uh, Father, we just thank you that we can gather in your name no matter where we are. And Father, uh, we just pray in, in these, uh, these difficult days in which our nation is divided in so many ways that you would bring peace to our nation, that you would bring reconciliation to our nation, especially that you would do so through the name of Jesus. Lift up his name in this dark time and let that light shine in this country so that others may turn to you and receive uh, the grace and life that you have for them. Heal our nation, heal our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, has anyone over the last couple of months as you've been sequestered at home uh, spent any time on YouTube? Okay, so you can admit it. This is confession time. Okay, okay, a few of you. Well, as, as you've been searching for uh, sports bloopers or cute kitty videos, uh, have you come across any of the uh, individuals who are talking about uh, a dream they had in which God was revealing to them some sort of end time scenario related to the pandemic? Has, has anybody seen any of those? Besides me? Besides me, yeah. Well, I didn't post my dream, but no. Anyway. And then there are all sorts of teachers, of course, that are jumping on that end times scenario bandwagon and uh, pointing to COVID as uh, one of the signs of the times. You know, there are always those who, who are uh, more than ready to sensationalize uh, current events in the name of the end times to attract listeners. Now, FYI, the, the, the phrase signs of the times appears only once in scripture. Jesus uses it, and he uses it in reference to his first coming, specifically his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, the term signs of the times does not biblically refer to the second coming of Christ or the end times. We have many presuppositions about the end times that may or may not actually be true. Now, the Apostle Peter is going to say something in this morning's text about the end times, and writing about the end times. Unlike so many who want to speak on the subject today, he says nothing, zilch, about signs of the times. He, with an end in view, will speak about practical Christian living now, with the end in view. All right, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. One truth should undergird our understanding of the end times. This truth has been relevant for every generation of believers since the first century and will continue to be relevant for all generations going forward. What do you need to know about the last time? What do you need to know about the revelation of Jesus Christ or his second coming? What do you need to know about the coming judgment? The end of all things is near. For those who are being distressed by various trials, for those who are being tested by fire, for those who are suffering unjustly or being harshly treated for the sake of righteousness, the nearness of the end of all things means that relief is at hand. Do not despair. Continue pressing on to the finish line. God is in control. The end of all things being near, are you living life in such a way as to best use the time you have left? Is God being glorified in your life? Now, the end of all things means the end of all things pertaining to the old order of the cosmos. The current heavens and earth will pass away, be burnt up to make way for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The eternal state of things is near. 
Are you ready to enter eternity? That's what Peter wants to focus your attention upon. How do we redeem the time we have in this present age? How do we live in readiness for the end of this present age? The end of all things is near. Therefore, here it comes, be of sound judgment and sober spirit. These two go together like peas and carrots. To be of sound judgment is to be sober-minded. Is to be sound or sober in mind. The mind or the state of one's mind is extremely important to Peter. To be of sober spirit is simply uh, the word sober. That's that's just literally the word Peter uses there, sober. And it means exactly what we would think it would mean. Free from the influence of intoxicants. Now this sense of sobriety is often associated in the New Testament with an attitude of awareness and alertness. Wakefulness and watchfulness. Jesus spoke about the need for your eye to be clear or single. So paraphrasing what Peter says here, I'd say always be clear-eyed and clear-minded. Or always see straight and think straight. Peter notes that this attitude is particularly important in four areas. Peter ties it in chapter 1 to being prepared in your mind for action. Action, knowing what to do and when to do it, is largely dependent upon sound judgment and a sober spirit. Peter here connects this attitude to Christ's near return. Now, the Apostle Paul vividly describes this in 1 Thessalonians, where he warns that this this coming day, this day of the Lord, is not to overtake us as a thief in the night. We are rather to be watchful, awake, and ready at all times for the Lord's return. That event, as Peter notes here, is near. And so Peter is emphasizing a focused, restrained, and purposeful demeanor or outlook in these last times. We're to be of sound judgment and sober spirit, he says, for the purpose of prayer. Now, Peter learned this the hard way. In the Garden of Gethsemane, following the Last Supper, Jesus took aside Peter, James, and John to pray. As Jesus prayed, the other three fell asleep. Jesus awoke Peter, saying, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it didn't just happen once, it happened three times. Jesus finally woke them up just in time for the betrayer's arrival with the soldiers who then arrested Jesus. So Peter learned the importance of keeping watch and praying the hard way. And he wants you to learn the same lesson, but to learn from his mistake and not make the same mistake. We're to be sober-minded and purpose-minded for prayer in difficult days like these, especially as the end of all things is near. Our nation caught in the midst of racial division, our world in the grip of pandemic needs prayer. And this is a necessary attitude so as to be ready for any attack from the devil. Now, I simply draw your attention to that because we'll, we'll talk about that more fully when we get into chapter 5. The end of all things is near. Therefore, keep fervent in your love for one another. Now, that was Jesus' message from the beginning. That was his commandment. Jesus gave love as a badge for the believer in this world. This is our credentials. Love makes obvious those who are children of God. Love is how all men will know you are Christ's disciple. Love assures you that you possess life in Christ, that you are born again, and that God abides in you. Love. You're to keep fervent in your love. That's literally the word straining. It's like an athlete straining to break the tape or to clear the bar. It requires eagerness, intensity, and discipline. You know, what we see going around the country, going on in the country in the last week or so, is the result of love not being put into action, a lack of love. If there was ever a time to stretch our love for one another to the limit, to enlarge the borders of our love, it's now. As most people's love grows cold, we are to turn up the fervency of our love, pushing farther, exerting more effort, determined to love. We, Christ's followers, should be setting the bar 
setting the pace for love. And then you're to be inclusive and unprejudiced in your love. You know, we gradually, uh, naturally gravitate towards some people. You know, that Philadelphia kind of love, that brotherly love that we feel toward others is, is naturally stronger toward some within the body. But our agape love, the, this, this love that we're to have in Christ for one another is to be inclusive, no exclusions, and room enough for more. Because God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And this love, Peter says, covers a multitude of sins. You know, covering something hides it, removes it from view. You don't look at it, you don't focus on it. Out of sight, out of mind, as it were. Love keeps no record of wrongs. We must overlook one another's wrongs. We must remove them from view and get them out of our minds where we ruminate on them, where we rehearse them and become embittered and hard-hearted over them. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be hospitable to one another without complaint, or cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Now, why hospitality of all things? That seems to be a little out of place in this consideration of things as, as, as the end is near. You know, why hospitality? Well, hospitality was a big deal in antiquity. You know, we typically reserve hospitality for our friends or family. Hospitality back then was focused on strangers, travelers, those passing through on their way to somewhere else. Uh, hospitality, the word hospitality is literally the word uh, love of stranger, love of a stranger. Now, the depth of hospitality is demonstrated in a couple of Old Testament stories, and uh, I refer you to them. Uh, we're not going to look at them. Uh, they'll be quick for you to look at later and review. Um, just take you a minute or two to read these, but Genesis chapter 18 and chapter 19, the first portion of each of those chapters. Great examples of old time hospitality. And one of them in particular, if you read it carefully, uh, really quite shocking in some of the things it communicates about their attitude toward hospitality. Now, as believers began going out into all the world with the gospel, hospitality was integral to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. As evangelists, preachers, and missionaries went out, as, as only as they were provided hospitality by fellow believers could they continue to carry out their work as they went. You know, how often in his own travels had Peter himself been the recipient of hospitality? You know, when he is summoned to go to, the, go to Cornelius and deliver the first gospel message to a Gentile audience, he was at the home of Simon in Joppa. He was a guest. Simon was, was uh, extending hospitality to Peter. Now, the vital niche filled by hospitality may not be the same today, but the need for it remains today. Open hearts, open homes, love for strangers. Now, one caveat regarding hospitality. Hospitality is not to be extended to false teachers. Providing hospitality to those who taught the gospel was aid and support in spreading the gospel, spreading the truth. Hospitality toward false teachers only helped to spread their error. And this, so this would be a form of supporting false teaching. Truth is not to be sacrificed for misplaced hospitality. Now, this is not a license to be rude or discourteous when a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon stops at your door. It's simply to say you don't have to make their job easier by giving tacit support. Now, hospitality has a payoff at the end of all things. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the nations are divided before him into two groups, what he describes as the sheep and the goats. Uh, those in the sheep category, those at his right, are invited to uh, uh, draw near and enter into their inheritance, the inheritance prepared for them since the foundation of the world. And six actions are mentioned as being responsible for their blessing. In that list, King Jesus says, I was a stranger and you invited me in. That's hospitality. And when exactly did we do this, they ask? 
Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Hospitality extended to others is ministry to Jesus himself. And he takes that personally. And he rewards it personally. The end of all things is near. Therefore, employ your gift in serving others. Now the word gift there is charisma, a gift of grace. Uh, or a a gracious gift. Uh, The word charismatic comes from this word, and sometimes uh, we we get a little skittish at at the thought of that word, but it's a perfectly good New Testament word, even if it has been co-opted by some branches of Christianity. Now, we would characterize such gifts as spiritual gifts or gifts of the Spirit. Now, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability to those in the body of Christ, which is to be used in service to the body until the Lord Jesus returns. Now, these gifts are for all believers. Each one has received a gift, Peter says. Every believer in the new birth is assigned at least one gift, likely more than one. No one in Christ is excluded. Now, you may not feel like it, Your gift may be dormant, neglected, unused, or untapped, but you have received a spiritual gift. This means that you are a steward of the manifold grace of God. A steward manages what belongs to another, his or her master. You'll either be a faithful and wise steward, a trustworthy steward, or a faithless, foolish, and untrustworthy steward. Each one of us, having received a spiritual gift, is a steward of the manifold grace of God. What kind of steward of that amazing grace will you prove to be? These gifts are varied. God is a God of variety, and so are these gifts. The grace of God is manifold, many-fold. There's not one gift. There are many gifts. As many as 19 specific gifts of the Spirit have been identified from the New Testament. There may well be more. We can be sure, whatever the number may be, that sufficient gifts have been bestowed by the Spirit to meet every need of the church. Now, Peter identifies two categories of spiritual gifts. And the first are speaking gifts. Speaking gifts are, are, are those that are sometimes, maybe most often, demonstrated in the most public way. They are therefore the more obvious and get the most attention. Today, unfortunately, uh, much of what passes for preaching really isn't. At best, it's a spiritual pep talk with the worship service being the pep rally. Uh, If not for an occasional Bible verse tossed in here and there, it could pass for a motivational speech. It isn't the utterance of God. J. Vernon McGee points out that if a man is not... speaking the word of God. He has no business standing in the pulpit speaking in the name of God. Speaking gifts are for the purpose of communicating God's word. That's it. God's word, not man's opinion and certainly not whatever the latest fad idea might be. Second, Peter says, are serving gifts. Now, serving gifts are often demonstrated in a less public way, often quite anonymously, And uh, they are therefore less obvious, but they are just as important. Serving gifts often support the speaking gifts. You know, I've only been able to do what I've been able to do the last few months during this, this pandemic and keep doing what we're doing now because of so many other people behind the scenes. Those running the soundboard, manning the computer, Uh, setting up the online feeds, preparing communion, cleaning the building, putting together and participating in the worship services. And then on a normal basis, whatever normal is now, we would have greeters, we would have coffee preparers, we would have staff nursery, we would have those helping with 252 and first look. So many people. We can't do this without you doing your intended part. Leslie Leslie Flynn says, the church cannot prosper unless those needed are functioning in their place. Now, let's be specific. West Lafayette Christian Church cannot prosper unless you are functioning in your God-intended place. 
Now, it's not uncommon when someone's given the opportunity to serve the body in some way that you hear things like, well, I've never really done anything like that before. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable with that. Or, well, I really don't know enough to teach a class or to, you know, lead in that kind of a thing. You know, you, you get those kind of responses from people. I just, you know, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. Well, guess what? You're now the perfect candidate uh, because it isn't about you at all. One serves by the strength which God supplies, Peter says. It's not the strength you supply. Otherwise, it'd be all about you. And it's not. Whether you've been a believer for many years or only a few months, we all serve by the grace of God, from the strength of God, and for the glory of God. Despite my skills, my experience, my knowledge, my comfort level, my busy schedule, God's grace is sufficient always for the task at hand. His power is perfected in my weaknesses. That's where He shines. It's not about me. It's about Him. And though Peter doesn't mention it, we can add a third category, sign gifts. Now, this is the category that typically tends to get labeled as charismatic, you know, uh, healings, miracles, speaking in tongues, interpretation. Now, I simply bring those to your attention so that you get a full picture of what we're talking about here. Peter doesn't mention these specifically, but you need to be aware of them. So, yes, these gifts are varied. Your gifts can also be expressed in a myriad of ways unique to your own personality and your talents. It isn't a one-size-fits-all when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. Varieties of gifts, varieties of ministries, varieties of effects. See, there's no one way to approach, perform, or execute your gift. It will be completely unique to you. And these gifts are not self-serving. Gifts are for the common good, not for individual glory or attention. They're they're to be employed, Peter says, in serving one another. Now, no one is gifted enough, wise enough, or strong enough to live apart from all the others in the body. I know we've kind of been separated from one another over the last few months, but and and, and the church is the church, right? That we're not divided by geography, but the body's intended to be together, right? To be connected, to have that connection. It's unnatural otherwise. It's much more difficult to be the body of Christ when we're set apart from one another. Uh, We need one another in the body of Christ, just as the physical body needs all of its members in place to properly function. We furthermore don't live in a parasitic relationship to each other, leeching off one another. You know, what are you going to do for me? No, it's more of a symbiotic relationship where we are all uh, functioning for the benefit of one another. What am I going to be able to do for you or give for you by our participation together? As stewards, we each use our gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. And ultimately, we serve Christ through serving the members of his body, the church. Now, we live out our faith in this focused restrained and purposeful way with the end of all things so near so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Since he gets the glory, our umbrella of love expands. It extends to cover others. Since he gets the glory, it's, it's easier for us to show hospitality, to, ex- to extend love to strangers in Jesus' name. And since he gets the glory, exercising our gifts is not a pain, but a privilege. And and we are able then together to help push and drive the kingdom forward in these last days. Now, living this way with the end so near, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. I'll stand as we continue in worship this morning. And I just wanted to say that, um, thank you for that message, John, that, um, 
that love that he's talking about, especially in a time right now when things are continually changing, um, where we're uncertain, where there's a lot of hate that's being spread right now. Um, just remembering that in this time of un uncertainty that God has this, this amazing love for us that is something we did not earn. Um, it's something we don't have to earn. Um, it's something that he gives us um, freely. So um, just remembering that while we sing this.
go ahead and be seated for just a moment. Jason's got a quick announcement here before we do communion. If you did not pick up uh, the communion cup on your way in, uh, if you want to go grab that uh, right now while you have a moment or two, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, I just want to let everybody know this Friday night, um, our community outreach team is having an outdoor movie, um, which, which will help with everything going on. Um, at 7.30, we're going to have s'mores in cinema is what we call it. So 7.30 do um, when it's dark enough to have an outside movie. So about 9.30 is going to be social time. Um, we're going to be outside. There's going to be lots of space, open air, um, so we can follow um, social distancing guidelines and whatnot. And so uh, we want to, really would love to have you come, you know, for an hour, a couple hours. Um, you know, like, like John said, the, the body getting together is one of the most important things we can do as a church. And, and during this time, you know, we miss a lot of you. And so just just being together, being outside um, is going to be a blessing. And then 930, we're going to start the movie. It's going to be Ice Age. So it's going to be great for kids um, and, and, and really the whole family. So we would love um, to see you. And, um, and just more, we're going to have three different fire pits. And so that'll kind of help limit the amount of people around one fire pit at a time. So that'll help as well. So um, we would just love to see you then. Thank you, Jason. And did you mention bring your chairs? Okay, so bring your chairs. Yeah. The Apostle Paul, speaking about the Lord's Supper, says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The end of all things may be near, but we continue to observe the Lord's Supper. We continue to commune with our Lord Jesus Christ in remembrance of him as we do it. And then we as his body continue to proclaim what he has done for each one of us. His death to give us life. And so in just a moment as you think about that, as you think what Jesus gave for you, uh, you have the emblems of communion there with you. Just whenever you're ready yourself, you can uh, take that. And then as you're ready, just go ahead and leave and uh, the, you can uh, put the cup in the, uh, the, the little covers uh, in the trash cans there uh, on the side of the doors as you go back out uh, underneath where you picked these up this morning. But um, we go out, uh, we gather as the body of Christ, and then we, we leave as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the blessing you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ, that in his death you give us life. And Father, we proclaim that this morning. We proclaim that by our presence here. We proclaim it as we fellowship with one another and with you in the partaking of the bread and the cup in Jesus' name. Amen.